we're distributing the final paper assignment for everyone. And you can see that it could, it could not be less restrictive. <laughs> so uh, it is uh, a prompt for you to use the engagement with the argument of the course as a device to develop not only your position, but also your voice, your way of thinking uh, and speaking and writing uh, and engaging the problems with which we have dealt here. It is not a research paper, obviously. Uh, you are free to cite whatever materials you like <coughs> from within the course or from outside, but <coughs> your paper should give evidence of a response to what has happened here. And a use of that response to develop your ideas your ideas about the character of the country and its possible futures. Uh, you are free to consult with one another, uh, to consult not just uh, classmates, other colleagues in the course, but anyone, uh, to share your drafts, to obtain opinions. Uh, the only restraint is the normal restraint in intellectual life, that you should be able to say of the final product in good faith that it is largely the expression of your own mind. Now, are there any questions about this assignment? So uh, one thing you should not do is come to us, to either of us, and ask whether this is a good topic or that is a good topic. Uh, if we did not want to be surprised, we would not have crafted the assignment in this fashion. <laughs> so it's not as if we had in our minds a, a view of what a good examination has to look like. Uh, it can look however you like. And uh, we're entirely open with regard to form as well as content. You will notice that there is a minimum size, but there is no maximum size. And uh, we can promise that every single word you, re you write will be, will be read. An exam that falls beneath the minimum size will also be read, but will arouse an expectation of concentrated insight. <laughs> uh, questions about this written assignment? You got a question? As yes. Well, Well, uh, I'm not sure. This is not a paper. It's an exam. Uh, normally, we will not write comments on exams. Uh, it's just impossible for both of us. Uh, we're all teaching several courses and doing many things. But maybe we can think of some way, if you have a particular interest in discussing, uh, a paper to arrange a time to meet with one of us. I think that would be the best way to do it. Uh, cursory remarks written on a paper mean very little, especially for a paper of this kind. So they don't seem to be a suitable response. Anything else? Yes. Well, as I said, you can use any materials that are, that are relevant, 
<clears throat> so long as you understand that the paper should not be a paper that you could hand into any course or to a course about the particular topic. So you're going to a, a seminar about X, uh, and then you write a paper about X. The, the, the paper should be a response to the argument here. And as you will have noticed in this course, the readings in the course are really just background. Uh, and the heart of the course is the argument conducted in, in this room. So the, <clears throat> the paper should be, in the first instance, an engagement with that argument. Uh, and then on the basis of that engagement, it can go in any direction. And you can use an allusion to any experience or text or uh, thinkers or agents in the course of this engagement and in your development of the response. Now, we have, after today's class, four more weeks. The original plan of the course set out in the syllabus was to Uh, deal with interpretive and historical approaches to the American experience in the earlier part of the course, the part of the course before the spring recess, and then to emphasize the discussion of alternative futures, the programmatic, uh, in this part of the course after the spring recess. But you will have noticed that we have not allowed ourselves to be bound by that original plan. And in all the preceding weeks, we have gone back and forth between the interpretive or historical on one side and the programmatic on the other. So in the following weeks, the weeks that remain to us, the emphasis will be programmatic. But uh, we will go back and forth, once again, mm. between the programmatic and the historical. And in the programmatic, we will address uh, the economy, education, and politics, the organization of democracy. But we will not be bound to that fixed plan. And in that regard, uh, we do want to ask you to suggest uh, other themes that we could incorporate into the final weeks of the course. So we're entirely open to your proposals. Uh, you could just email either of us or both of us or speak with Peter uh, and we'll consider uh, a revision of our initial plan. You want to say something about that, Cornell? No, I just say ditto, brother. <laughs> that sounds good to me. Shall we begin? Yeah, begin. Let us plunge into the alternative programmatic, programmatic, but let's begin with the arts. Let's begin with the site in the history of this empire where visions that have to do with bringing critique and indictment to bear on the status quo are most robust. And this is quite fascinating because when you think of the dominant ideologies that have been hegemonic in the history of the American empire, usually it's one of limitless possibility, unbelievable energy overcoming constraints, no problem we cannot solve, no dilemma we cannot overcome. This is mainstream American sensibility, but when we look at the history of the American novel, when we look at the history of American poetry, when we look at the history of American music, especially the blues, especially jazz, especially rhythm and blues, and hip hop, what do we see? We see a wrestling with what strikes us as something profoundly un-American, which is nihilism. Nihilism. I try to suggest this, of course, in Democracy Matters, a text I wrote almost 20 years ago now. Nihilism 
in America. I mean, when I wrote that, they said, my God, Professor West, there's no such thing as nihilism in America. You been in America long enough to understand this is a land of hope and liberty. This is a land of possibility. This is a land in which we always come to terms with reality and history. I said, well, have you read Herman Melville? Why is he the greatest novelist in the history of the American empire? And the legacy, legacy that he unleashed, Robert Penn Warrens, the poet and novelist, all the king's men, Chief Joseph of Nez Perez, Brother the Dragons, or Eugene O'Neill, and of course we know probably the finest American actor right now, Denzel Washington, begins this week on Broadway, playing Hickey, The Iceman Cometh, which is the most profound play written by Eugene O'Neill, who is the most profound playwright in the history of the American empire. And if you haven't read Iceman Cometh, it's hard to watch it on TV, it's almost five hours. It requires a lot of popcorn, a whole lot of patience, the Jason Robards. Kevin Spacey, and now Denzel Washington, who is Hickey, very much like Death of a Salesman, another towering figure in the history of the American stage of Arthur Miller. He's a salesman, buying and selling at the center of so much of American culture. But he's a salesman of dreams. Oh, yes, he's selling dreams. And the ways in which those dreams are shattered and hope. Harry Hope Salone. I'm not going to go through the whole story, but please get a chance to take a look, wrestle with this particular Irish brother who emerges as part of the legacy of a Herman Melville. And the highest expression in the novel, the 20th century of that Melvillean legacy, Tony Morrison, wrestling with nihilism, not epistemic or epistemological or philosophical nihilism, but existential nihilism, the experiences of lovelessness and meaninglessness and hopelessness, of being deracinated and rootless, being unable to have healthy experiences of intimacy and vulnerability and vincibility, and what happens to such souls, what happens to such selves, what happens to such individuals, we were reminded of a Thornton Wilder in his Charles Norton lectures here at Harvard many, many decades ago on what? American loneliness. Echoes of what you read in de Tocqueville's great classic in that section, why Americans are so restless in the midst of prosperity, that sadness, that disquietude, that inability to believe in themselves, trust in themselves enough when it comes to issues of meaning, issues of feeling, not issues of buying and selling, not issues of quest for prosperity, not issues of obsession with status and honor and power, but what it means to be a human being at the deepest level. And there's so many different examples, I'm just highlighting certain ones, but there's a real sense in which for us to talk concretely and substantively about alternative visions, alternative analysis, alternative strategies and tactics, alternative movements vis-a-vis -a, -vis a status quo, we cannot downplay the role of the artist. That last line of Shelley's Posthumously published text in defense of poetry. Poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. And he's not talking about versifiers. He's talking about all of those who muster the courage to use imagination and empathy to conceive of alternative ways of being in the world vis-a-vis -vis status quo that often contain us. So when you're talking about poetry, you're not talking about some kind of ornamental additive element in our compartmentalized lives. We have time to go to the museum and get a sense of a little art and a little culture. That's exactly the opposite of what I'm talking about. I'm talking about artists who provide us with the kinds of energy, the kinds of potency that can generate agency so that we're able to think, act, enact, and embody alternatives, be it personal, be it microsocial, be it macrosocial. That's why Moby Dick, that's why 
the wasteland of an Elliot. That's why a Bello, a Mailer, a Muriel Rookheiser play such an important role in my text and my own thinking. And it's precisely because the challenge of nihilism has been one of the fundamental issues with which the most mature poets, artists in the history of the American empire have had to come to terms with. Now, there are different forms of nihilism. The notion of might makes right. The notion of violence dictates the destiny of a nation, manifest destiny. The notion of innocence used as a rationalization of that violence. The notion of living a life of such intense mendacity and hypocrisy to understand yourself as somehow residing in a nation that exemplifies the highest levels of freedom and downplaying or hiding and concealing the structures of unfreedom that constitute the foundation of your own freedom and the ways in which to follow Malcolm X, those kind of chickens come home to roost. You're haunted by the ghost of those peoples and those communities, crushed, demeaned, demonized, and we're at a moment now, in 2018, in which more and more those chickens are coming home to roost. There's evangelical nihilism. That's a fascinating description of what's going on in the White House right now. Just bold, unashamed of might dictating right. Bold and unashamed of power determining what is moral. Bold and unashamed of downplaying the moral and spiritual issues that animated the genius of a Melville or a Murray or Rookheiser or those slaves who sang spirituals in structures of unfreedom constituting pillars of American freedom for others on plantations or before they were lynched under U.S. Jim Crow, singing the blues, and those who survived stringing, singing about that strange fruit. That these particular voices, these particular ways of being in the world, these particular ways of wrestling with, combating nihilism, but never conquering nihilism. You turn to Moby Dick, for example, Ishmael, down and out, wrestling with what? Despair, depression, on the way to addiction and self-medication. Does that sound familiar in American culture today? Pervasive. Call me Ishmael. Melville begins that text. And we keep in mind he wrote that text when he was late 20s, early 30s. So you all, roughly that age, you got some serious work to do. Serious work to do. But he was wrestling with those issues earlier, call me Ishmael. And the first thing he does on his way to the boat is what? He goes to a black church. It's usually a section overlooked. And in that black church, way off on the chocolate side of town in New Bedford, he hears the minister talk about the blackness of blackness. And he sees the folk in the church moving. He calls it a black parliament. He says, these folk can possibly constitute a tremendous source of inspiration because they cannot deny the catastrophic in the midst of the American empire. They're living the catastrophic every day of their lives. How will they come to terms with the catastrophic? That's one of the reasons why the black artistic movements, especially music, but not solely music, constitute such a tradition of moral and spiritual fortitude to be able to look the catastrophe in the face unflinchingly and artistically raise one's voices by transfiguring that suffering, those wounds and those scars into sonic expressions, spirituals, blues. 
jazz. Melville, very attuned to one of these leavens in the American loaf, which is this artistic tradition coming out of a context of these dominated peoples. But they have no monopoly on it. Melville himself, lower middle class, out of New York City. Robert Penn Warren, out of Kentucky, border state, southerner, himself supporter of white supremacist segregation for the first slice of his life, and yet continues to grow and develop and write some of the strongest critiques and indictments. And of course, I mentioned Eugene O'Neill himself, Irish, born in a hotel, died in a hotel right here in Boston. Lower middle class, too. Went to Princeton for a few semesters, drank too much, never graduated, but at least two Princetons went through him. That's the crucial thing, as artists, as truth teller. Now, his indictment, which is the bleakest artistic depiction, interpretation, description, no explanation. He's not a sociologist. He's an artist. There's no explanation of the decay and the decline. He's laying it bare. He reaches a conclusion that America as a nation will never have enough citizens who will muster the critical capacity and the compassionate, compassionate capacity to come to terms with its catastrophic history and present. They can involved in problem solving within very narrow liberal frameworks or conservative frameworks, but they won't come to terms with empire. They won't come to terms with white supremacy. They won't be able to hit the structures of patriarchy and homophobia and transphobia. And that's why in that ice man cometh when Hickey shows up. And you see all those Americans in that saloon of all colors, all <coughs> cultures and regions, right? apathetic, feeling impotent, powerless, unable to lift their voices. And what did Eugene O'Neill say in the interview for that play? He said, this makes my country, and he could have said, my beloved country, the most tragic of all social experiments because it had so much potential and so much possibility, but it squandered it because it didn't cultivate what we've called in this class the soul craft required for its great energies and possibilities to be at least partially realized in such a way that it would not lead toward chaos, disaster, decline, and decay. And when he talks about decline and decay, he's not just talking about material decay. He's talking about the quality of lives in a nation. All of those lives, from ruling class, upper middle class, working class, poor, lumping proletariat, women, men, all of those lives. And what are the dominant ways in which people attempt to define what it means to be human in that social experiment? Now, it's true to Eugene O'Neill himself, profoundly pessimistic, his favorite philosopher being Schopenhauer. His favorite playwright was August Strindberg, who's one of the most pessimistic playwrights in the history of Europe. Acknowledged this in his 1936 address when he won the Nobel Prize in Literature. And he won the prize in literature before he wrote The Ice Man Cometh. He won the prize, then went off to live all by himself in Dow House in California. All by himself with Carlotta, his, his wife, his fourth wife. Every page, she said in writing it, tears flowing. Long day's journey into night. Ice man cometh, a moon for the misbegotten, all three together. Prophetic figure. What is the content? What's the substance of so many of the American prophets? Do we take him, them seriously? Not just the political ones. We talked about Lincoln a bit. In the 20th century, we could talk about Dorothy Day, Grand Catholic figure, Rabbi Heschel, a great Judaic figure, Martin Luther King Jr., great black and Christian figure. But the artists, 
push even further than the political activists about this issue of nihilism, evangelical nihilism, those who are almost proud, if not unashamed, of saying it all comes down to power. Forget morality, forget spirituality, push integrity, honesty, and decency, and generosity out of the window. If you don't have the power, don't come in here to play this game. This is about the powerful. And that power has to do with money, it has to do with decisions made in structures and institutions, it has to do with self-confidence and self-trust and self-esteem, and if you don't have those, you're gonna be crushed like some Herbert Spencer-like social evolutionary process in which the weak are always crushed by the strong. And that's very different than Darwin, but Herbert Spencer was a certain bastardization when it applies to society from what Darwin was talking about in terms of biology. But that became very, very popular in America, and we understand in many ways why. In addition to evangelical nihilism, there's paternalistic nihilism. We see this oftentimes in the Democratic Party and neoliberals. We know how corrupt the system is. We know how tied we are to Wall Street. We understand a degree to which we're dependent on our corporate sponsors and those who can provide monies. We understand that that's the way the game is played, but we're gonna act as if we're real Democrats, small d. We're gonna act as if John Dewey really means something to us when it's really about very much like the Grand Inquisitor and Dostoevsky's brothers Karamazov, we no longer believe in this democratic stuff. We don't think ordinary people's voices really ought to be heard. We just echo that in our rhetoric. But when we really steal away, and smoke off cigars at the Princeton and Harvard clubs in Boston and New York City, we say this demos, we got to keep them contained. They get out of control. This populism is a danger. And usually when they would use the word populism, they act as if there's only one populism. Right-wing xenophobic populism as opposed to left-wing progressive populism that go, that spill outside of the narrow framework of conservatism on the one hand and neoliberalism on the other. Another way of ensuring there is no alternative. The premise of this class, that premise to be interrogated, it's already been radically interrogated by so many of the artists. Oh, if we could read Muriel Rukeyser's 1949 text, Life of Poetry, herself the teacher of an Adrian Rich and an Alice Walker, two towering figures themselves in the history of the arts, wrestling with nihilism in the United States. What kinds of countervailing voices can they muster? One of the things we've said over and over, and I've been accenting in this class, is a degree to which that skeleton that hangs in the closet of this class, this notion that alternative views in the favor of poor and working people and in, in favor of the weak and vulnerable can in some sense be victorious. Because when you look at the history of American social movements, most of those if not all of those outside of the narrow framework get crushed. They're defeated. Not just by repression, even though repression plays its role with the FBI. And fellow citizens informing on other fellow citizens like Martin Luther King Jr.'s photographer who was with him for over 20 years, every day made over 10,000 pictures and every day was calling in the FBI to give his report. That's just one small example of the surveillance. The unbelievable fear and sense of uh, being a those on, on top being afraid of some kind of organizing and mobilizing precisely the kind of things that Professor Unger and myself are calling for. And for those who opt for these alternatives, we have to take very seriously what our artists have taught us, not because they advise us to become cowards, but rather because they say, 
if you don't have the requisite intellectual, moral, and spiritual courage, you're never ever going to be a long distance runner in this quest for alternative vision and strategy and analysis rooted in the struggles of everyday people, both here and around the world. Now, in Melville's case, and I don't know even who even teaches Melville now uh, in, in, in Harvard. I'm sure they do, because we, we used to have a brother, Henry Murray, who was a professor of psychology, who was a Melville freak. I used to love to be at his house, because he had a whole basement of all Melville texts. He lived right across the street from the Divinity School on Francis Avenue. I was, oh, God, you, I'm a Melville freak myself. Let, let's kick it together. Mm -hmm. Oh, we used to have a magnificent time. What was it about this Melville for Henry Murray? Well, he studied William James and the sick soul. He saw a connection between sick souls and Ahab. And you all know the story of Ahab on the people. <coughs> you all know the stories of what happens at the end of that story in which all that is left is just a coffin-like Shaft in the ocean with Ishmael on that piece of wood after Ahab goes down with the Pequod, after the white whale overturns the Pequod. The Pequod is what? A multiracial context in which various persons constituting community, God bless you, with a fundamental end and aim, and it goes under. It goes under. The Melville of the confidence man, the trickster, the Melville of Bartlesby. I prefer not to. The great refusal on Wall Street. The Melville of Benito Serino, the slave revolt on the slave ship. The Melville of the bell tower. We can go on and on and on. What a prophet. And the content and substance is what? I believe that America's promise and America's possibility needs to be taken seriously, but when I look at the forms of evasion and avoidance among my fellow citizens, I don't see them cultivating the capacity to confront it, and sooner or later, America, like the Pequod, is going under step by step and stage by stage. How many copies did Moby, Moby Dick sell when it was published in 1851? few hundred went out of print, didn't come back until 1921. And Raymond Weaver and a host of other literary critics, the Lewis Mumfords and others said, we have a prophetic voice we have overlooked. If it had, wasn't for the Mark Twains in between that period, another great prophetic figure, another critic of white supremacy in Huckleberry Friend, critic of the American empire, critic of patriarchy, and he more and more is pushed to the margins with his fashionable white suit that he had and his unbelievable sense of the comic and humor. Another crucial American prophet pushed to the margins, but coming back now with tremendous power. We even use his category, right? He's the one who coined the Gilded Age. What are people calling in the last 10 years, last 15 years, the second gilded age? The robber barons, the 1%, the escalating wealth inequality and wage stagnation and collapsing housing and decrepit school systems among work, poor and working people. That's what he saw between 1877 and his death in 1910. How then do we proceed wrestling with evangelical nihilism? what I call paternalistic nihilism among the, the neoliberals. By paternalistic, what I mean is won't tell the people the truth, but want to act in pose and posture as if they're actually in deep solidarity with poor and weak working people rather than an extension of corporate power, an extension of the military industrial complex. The third kind of nihilism that I invoke very briefly in the text is what I call sentimental nihilism. And that's what you get in mass media. The fourth estate. They call it alt news now, they call it, but it's not as if Trump comes into office and mass media starts lying. No, 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 that's not true at all. No, no, not at all. It's market driven. If it bleeds, it leads. You want sensationalism. 
You want something that's entertaining. You want something that's amusing. You want to amuse, make sure Americans amuse themselves to death without having a commitment to public life and public conversation and public things. And without public things, you can't have a democracy. And that's the fundamental aim of the dominant forms of mass, entertain of mass media, corporate media, so-called mainstream media, and so on. We've talked about this before in terms of Trump himself was a product of that. Every minute, every speech, every Twitter, every come on to Twitter, cover it for money. Revenues go up. Profits go up. America goes down. Spiritually, morally, goes down. Who cares? We're in this for the money. Facebook got the same challenge. Google's got the same challenge. Microsoft had the same challenge. IBM had the same challenge. American Motor Company had the same. We can go back and we can go forward. What? is left in terms of sites and spaces to cultivate the kinds of souls and selves and persons in American democracy toward integrity and honesty and decency, truth-telling and witness-bearing. What places are left that would make these a priority? And the artists are telling us what? It's a question of formation of attention. How do you get fellow citizens to attend to the raw stuff that constitutes the possibility of alternative thinking, alternative looking, alternative living. And that battle over attention of fellow citizens is an intense one, is a very intense one. We used to call it education. The Greeks called it paideia. That's what education is, to change your attention, to reshape your attention, to get you to attend to things that fundamentally matter. How then do you hold at arm's length the distractions, superficial surfaces, and so on? That's the kinds of issues that you see at work among the artists. Toni Morrison says, you think you understand something about love? Read Be Loved and watch how that's going to blow your mind and heart and soul of a precious mother who kills her baby rather than have that baby so dirtied up, as she says, by white supremacist abuse, sexually violated at 12 or 14, the way Sally Hemmings was the lover of Thomas Jefferson. I'd rather have my child dead than to have to live that kind of life. Oh, Toni Morrison, you're using your imagination. No, that's the story of Margaret Garner. It's historically based. It's in the archive. I'm using my literary imagination to reconceive it, but it's a fact, and it happened across the board. Yes, love is a very, very difficult, complicated thing, especially for unloved people. I'm in the Melvillian tradition. When Toni Morrison gave her Charles Norton lectures here, called Playing in the Dark, it's no accident that she spends most of her time talking about Herman Melville and what Melville's meant to her as a literary figure. Why do I keep coming back to this connection? Because these are figures in the American grain. See, that these are figures who are as American as Donald Trump, any other figure. We have to be able to look at both of them, both streams and strands in the American grain. But one is less powerful, past and present. Past and present. There's something about the history of the American stage that we need to know. We got Professor Sister Jill here, who's such a magnificent artist, and head of the dance department I always invoke because the connection between bodies moving on stages with words moving with those bodies has always been one of the sites where some of the deepest truth-telling takes place. Tennessee Williams, the August Wilson, or is that uh, we just had the sister from Detroit here in Boston uh, building on that tradition, you see. Uh, and the ways in which the, the music and the musicians have tried to push us. The Stephen Sondheims, 
the musical stage, Assassins, Sweeney Todd. What role will artists play in any serious wrestling with the past, present, and future of American democracy? All three go together. You have to understand the past in order to be able to confront the present, in order to conceive an alternative vision. There's no separation of those three dimensions. And our greatest artists understand this very, very well. And I think it's, it's quite appropriate for us to begin with de Tocqueville because he's very much talking about soul craft. And he makes his predictions about the role of art in America. And the artist responded, and in some sense, went far beyond his expectations. And one could say, and it's not a cliche, that the American empire at this very moment is beginning to catch up with Melville, and it is frightening because he's got a bleak conclusion unless there's a massive awakening, massive awakening. When he died, no recognition of who he was. Greatness overlooked. The last story, Billy Budd, unpublished. Silent for almost 30 years in the novel. 1857, last piece. He dies in 1891. What a silence that speaks so loud in terms of its challenge to us. But those artists who came on after didn't forget Melville. That's why Toni Morrison or Robert Penn Warren or Eugene O'Neill or Thomas Pynchon, we can go on, there's a number of figures we can talk about who remember that challenge in terms of trying to generate the kind of spiritual and moral requisites for alternative ways of being in the world in an empire that is so powerful in terms of its seductions, powerful in terms of its ways of incorporating and diluting souls and persons to become part of a mainstream that too often is shot through with an indifference to the vulnerable and a callousness to the forms of injustice in its midst. Let me stop there. Open it up for questions, queries, before we uh, turn it over to Bella. Yes, my dear Bella. And speak up so we can all hear. In the, the Tocqueville text. And, and, and Lynn, too. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, the kind of democratizing that the new social media uh, enacts, I think you've got a good point. The problem is, is that we can't assume that simply because people have access to new technology that their souls and voices have been shaped in such a way that they have something profound to say. It could just be the massive distribution of more mediocrity and myopia and low quality expression. And in part, that's what it is. Now, I don't really follow social media too much, but I check every once in a while. I said, oh my God, if this is the future of American democracy, we all need to go to the crack house because uh, uh, it doesn't look good at all. But you've got other voices that are there that are significant because of some, many of those voices have been excluded. That's true. Many of those voices have been excluded, very much so. But I don't think that it's in any way a, um, a, a reason to cheer simply because more people have, have, have assets. It's the question of what is the quality of the voices among that new group. It's like assuming that, well, if you allow more women, more black folk, more gays and lesbians, more trans into formerly deeply white supremacist patriarchal spaces, 
that some kind of grand democratic transformation is going to take place. That's not true. All you're going to get is black faces, brown faces, woman faces, gay faces, lesbian faces in high places. And if they don't choose to democratically transform those institutions, those institutions remain very much in place in terms of class hierarchy, in terms of imperial policy. But it's just more colorful at the top. You see the point I'm making? So that the kind of transformation that we're talking about, there is no substitute. Courage, integrity, sacrifice, no matter what color, sexual orientation, gender you are. You see. And same is true with those voices. You can democratize the voices all you want. But if they're just echoes and they're not genuine voices calling for change, you just get a larger choir. But the quality is, has not been elevated. Now, as you know, I mean, I'm, I'm very much for what bureaucratic administrations call diversity. Oh, we need more diversity. We need students of different colors. Yes, I agree. No doubt about it. I'm against white supremacy, male supremacy. But simply because you're against white supremacy doesn't mean that people of color who enter in are going to be courageous or have integrity. It just means they're going to take up some spaces. And they deserve the spaces. They're smart. They're talented. Everybody gets in qualified because when you got 45 applications, 45,000 applications to Harvard, only got 1,660 seats the second time around. Everybody going to be qualified. So yes, diversity very important. Let's fight for it. But quality is the crucial issue, and quality is tied to transformation at the deepest level. And that's what I'm calling. That's what I'm looking for when those voices that you're talking about, who we historically have been excluded, are now included. Does that begin to get at your question? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Right. Well, just rise. Well, yeah. It's hard. Now, what would be the basis of your belief that just rising up? You see what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, Jill Scott been out there a long time, but Rihanna is still rising up. You know what I mean? Everybody knows Jill Scott can out sing Rihanna. Rihanna knows that herself. How come Jill Scott not, not rising up the way Rihanna is? Something else going on. I'm not against Rihanna, and I love Barbados. But... <laughs> But, but the point is, something else is going on rather than just quality, rather than just somebody who can really, really sing. See what I mean? Now, given that, I'm not sure that Melville's text would necessarily rise up. You know, if that were the case, Thomas Pynchon would have won most of the prizes in this nation and the Nobel Prize a long time ago. Long time ago. Yes, question. Ooh, but, but, but speak up and real, a little slower, my brother. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. No, but I think your commentary is very important. It's, it's a wonderful conversation between both of you all in that regard. The ways in which what seems to be democratization is really a certain kind of inclusion that reinforces a hierarchy tied not just to regulation and surveillance. We've got to talk about surveillance here in terms of Facebook, Google, other major institutions of, 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 of social media, and their connection to the nation state, and their connection to the national security state. We saw that with Snowden and a whole host of other examples in this regard. So here again, it becomes an instance of what I was calling loosely sentimental nihilism in which you pose and posture as if in media you're democratizing when in fact you're including, there's no doubt about that, but on certain terms tied to market ends and aims and reinforcing not just hierarchy but monopoly, reinforcing oligopoly when it comes to communication with little or no public accountability of those monopolies, of those oligopolies. So that Bill Gates, for example, you know, he's a wonderful brother, he's got magnificent philanthropy and so forth. You watch him go to war when there's an attempt of the people to render Microsoft accountable vis-a-vis -vis its strategies in the market, vis-a-vis -vis its competitors. Very, very free marketeering. Very much so. The other side of democratic accountability. Same would be true, I think, with, uh, with Facebook. What's the brother's name? Brother Mark, I think? Yeah, Brother Mark. We just saw him uh, at the graduation the other day. I saw him. And I wanted to give him a hug and everything. Brother, you're smart, brother. You graduated here. You made a lot of money. Now let's see what kind of accountability you're willing to put up with because I'm coming at you. You know, in the name of democracy. Don't, don't hate you. You represent an institution that has unbelievable influence, unbelievable power. Are you going to use it on behalf of empowerment? Or are you going to use it on behalf of profit maximizing with some philanthropy that goes with it? But he knows he's part of a larger international capitalist system in which the, the profit maximization is the precondition. And he has to be very courageous to try to, in some sense, democratize his institution. Any last question? Yes, my dear sister. Yes. Absolutely. especially in terms of democracy committed to public things, public education in this, in this, in this case, yeah. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I hear you. Yeah, I think in the case of Brother Bill Gates, I've never met him or anything, but he strikes me, he and his wife, they, they have their hearts in the right place in terms of wanting to help, but they're thoroughly misled in thinking that by helping, they're going to privatize the school system and do it in such a way that it only affects the top slice and the rest are dangling and the public schools continue to fail. And this, he's not the only one. You got Eli Broad, you got a whole wave, Muskowitz, Sister Ava Muskowitz, a whole wave of folk 
trying to privatize. Now, what also happens is that uh, you also militarize because you got more and more securities in these schools that they have an experience of the militaristic uh, ways of being in the world now in first grade, second grade, third grade, and what have you. Uh, and the crucial thing you noted was the elimination of the arts. And this is something that we struggled with in New York City. We went Marcellus and myself met a wonderful sister, Natalie Lieberman, who recently died. Uh, they came up with learning through the arts when they eliminated all of the arts programs in most of the public schools. So we had private money to provide some kind of arts for the young folk. And see, when it comes to young people of color, this is a form of spiritual warfare. Because if you have young people who can't learn how to play instruments, can't learn how to sing in tune, can't learn how to sing in a group in harmony, that's not just entertainment. These are sites of self-confidence and agency and self-respect. When you take that away, and there's hardly any other sites, you watch your gang activity grow up. I mean, it escalate. When Charlie Parker said, I'm blowing this horn and playing Cherokee because if I didn't, I'd be shooting somebody. That's not a joke. That's the kind of rage he's got inside of him. You let a generation grow up that can't play instruments and can't sing. Some of them make money and can't sing, but that's another issue. <laughs> that's just low quality. You know. Carmen McRae turns over in her grave. So does Nat King Cole. So does, Carmen, so does Donny Hathaway. They sang in tune. They played the notes right. But no instruments now. It's just push a button on the computer. Play the loops. Make money. Hey, that's what traditions come down to? Just play loops and make money? The drummer song is just a push button rather than playing the drums? There's a qualitative difference in terms of creativity, imagination, self-confidence, self-respect, self-esteem. You see, So that's, what, that's spiritual warfare there. And you notice the Tocqueville's term for this when he talks about uh, the black condition is what? Spiritual despotism. This is 1835. Black people wrestling with a form of spiritual despotism. That their souls become colonized with white supremacist perceptions in which you are less than, don't have capacity, don't have intelligence, less than. Well, in the music, that's one of the sites that's always been the pushback. What happens when it's, even the music is gone? You watch the gang activity. You watch the hatred, the contempt. That's what Martin King was fighting against. That's what Coltrane's Love Supreme was fighting against. You see, that's what Savion Glover was fighting against. That's why he was a Coltranian with his feet. Y'all know Savion Glover? Well, I don't see too many folks. You, you know who I'm talking about. Yeah, he's a tap dancer of the highest art. He's an artist in that way. Goes hand in hand with what we're talking about hand in hand with the possibilities of a democracy that can survive by generating people who are tied to a love and a justice rather than a hatred and a revenge and so forth. So you, you, you're absolutely right in this regard. I just, I mentioned Bill Gates because he's such an iconic figure, but it's not a matter of, of individuals. Just like when we talk about Donald Trump, it's not just Donald Trump. Every individual has to take responsibility for their actions, but they're part of larger manifestations in the society both present and past. There was one last question before we, I'm always turning my back to this wonderful side here. Yes, go right ahead. Oh yeah, wonderful. Well, no, I think that uh, if you're going to be a marvelous pioneer as a legal practitioner on the one hand and an artist on the other, I mean, you also want to bring in other artists, so it's not all the art doesn't fall just on you. You, you bring together, and, and it's, it's an integration in the sense of these artists are part and parcel of this moment in a larger movement 
and therefore they are indispensable in the same way the legal skills that I have are indispensable, especially for a vulnerable, vulnerable group that has been so demonized in recent years, namely our precious and priceless immigrants. Because the forms of empowerment and inspiration that's required for vulnerable people of any sort, no matter where they are in the world, but in this case, immigrants in the States, uh, um, is, is, is so crucial. There's no way they can sustain their spirits over time without the various needs that they have being addressed, and some of those needs are artistic and spiritual and moral as well as material and legal in that way. Uh, but legal practitioners who are also artists, nobody comes to mind. I think that you are, yeah, you're going to set a whole new standard here. Should we, should we hand our dear brother? Yeah. So I have a double purpose in the remarks that I'm going to make. Uh, one of my purposes is to help build a bridge between the parts of the course in which, despite our programmatic discussions, the emphasis has been historical and interpretive to the following weeks in which the emphasis will be primarily programmatic. But my second purpose is to bring together different strands in our discussion, mm. at least as they appear from my standpoint, and suggest a picture of where we are in our argument and of the relations among its several parts. And for this purpose, I want to proceed very schematically in six steps. First, the country. Second, the problem. Third, the divergence, the divergence, what does not work to solve the problem. Fourth, the project that is now needed and possible. Mm -hmm. Fifth, the threshold, that is, the initial steps by which we might begin to advance in this project. And sixth, the opportunity presented by the moment that we are now in. So first, the country. We had a discussion of American exceptionalism, which we continue today. And I presented uh, a view of 11 characteristics of the country that made it exceptional in a small sense, not in a large sense an outlier in a range of advanced societies, especially in the North Atlantic world. Uh, there are two sets of those features that we might take as central. Central to American consciousness and central to the reality and experience of the American people. The first has to do with the primacy of the ideal of self-construction. The individual builds himself. The promise of democracy, the democratic faith, is belief in the constructive genius of the ordinary man and woman. But according to this view of the primacy of self-construction, that genius is expressed primarily an individual initiative. Individual initiative modified or complemented by voluntary association. Uh, so it's as if the demands of society, of solidarity, uh, the way we build ourselves through our connections to the others were something external but the heart of self-construction, according to this view, lies within the individual himself. Uh, the, the free individual building himself for self then chooses to associate with others, voluntary association, and centrists and conservatives in the United States have always been attracted to the theme of voluntary association as the complement or the modifier 
of the emphasis on individual self-construction. Now, at the same time, the United States, like all the contemporary societies, including the most equal of them, is a class society. And among the rich industrial democracies of the North Atlantic world, it is the most unequal, the most rigid class structure. So there is a, a contradiction between the emphasis on the ability of the individual to make himself great by individual initiative and the experience to which the experience of subjugation, of belittlement, of constraint, to which the reality of the class structure consigns the vast majority of the people. So we might say that then in this American experience, there are two great sources of melancholy. And together they compose the background to this experience that Cornell just labeled nihilism. The first source of melancholy is isolation. Salvation lies in the individual and individual self-construction. Connection to the others is an adventitious element, something that's added or not but that is somehow external to the core. Now, we know that one of the great sources of joy, of affirmation of existence, mm -hmm. is connection. But the other source of melancholy is the experience of humiliation, of constraint, mm -hmm. and of belittlement, uh, perpetually reproduced by the class structure, and denied in the self-representation of a society that imagines itself not to be a class structure. Uh, so this combination of the demotion of solidarity, its consignment to the instrument of voluntary association, and the underlying reality of a class structure that is not confronted or even recognized for what it is, then becomes the source of the melancholy that coexists mm -hmm. with the triumphalist message of self-construction. Now comes the second great theme in the singularity of the American experience or of the American consciousness. The second theme is the naturalization or the reification of a particular version of a free order. So the country imagines itself to be the most perfect example available to humanity of a free society. And the reason why it claims to be that is that it believes that at the time of its foundation, its founders, its architects, discovered the definitive institutional formula of a free society. And this formula has to be only amended rarely from time to time under the pressure of crisis. So then the contingent political and economic institutions, the particular arrangements of politics and of the market economy that happen to have evolved in the course of modern Western history and that have their American variant, are mistaken for an approximation to this conception of the ideal blueprint of a free society. This reification, this naturalization of the idea of freedom is constantly reinforced in many different ways as we have emphasized in the discussions of the course. 
First, it is reinforced by ideas. Uh, ideas that are not only philosophical, but present in the reigning orthodoxies of all of the major social disciplines, beginning with the two that have the greatest practical influence, law and economics. Second, this naturalization of the free order is enacted as a form of politics by constitutional arrangements, the constitutional arrangements of a proto-democratic liberalism, as I have called it, that deliberately inhibit the transformation of society or of the economy by politics, that make it hard to change society through political action, except in the enabling circumstance of great military or economic crisis. And third, the naturalization of the free order is reinforced by a practical economic reality, which is the fiscal starvation of the state. The American democracy, as I have observed in an earlier class, uh, allows the state to take in much less by way of aggregate public revenue than the state takes in in any of the other advanced Western democracies. So as a practical matter, aside from the ideas and the arrangements of politics, the state characteristically lacks in the United States the resources for effective transformative action. Now, the problem. The essential problem, it's not a problem just of the American democracy, it's a problem of all contemporary societies, but it is presented with particular starkness in the context of the circumstance that I've just described, uh, is that the uh, enormous vitality of the country, the vast cauldron of human energy, of dynamism, of aspiration, of innovation, of hope, of hopeful action, goes to waste for lack of instruments and opportunities. This is the essential problem. This is the tragic element in the life of these democracies, and in particular of the, of the American democracies. And in the present circumstance, this tragedy uh, is expressed especially in two features of the situation. One feature is the dispossession, the dispossession or the oppression of the working class majority of the country, including the white working class majority of the country. Uh, its exclusion from the advanced forms of production and of education. And the other circumstance, the counterpart to this one, is the confinement of the now most advanced practice of production, the knowledge economy, to insular vanguards, to fringes within each part of the production system that exclude the vast majority of workers and of firms. Now, the diversions by which I mean what does not work. Now, I don't intend to enter into a, uh, a sustained argument, but only to signal back to arguments that we've had in earlier moments of the course. So, first, voluntary association. Uh, voluntary association has often been evoked as the sufficient antidote to these ills, or as the complement that would fix everything. So the market should have as its counterpart voluntary association. Centrists uh, 
progressive conservatives of different kinds, uh, communitarians have been attracted to this ideal. But voluntary association, like the market economy or like the abstract idea of the free order, is not a self-defining conception. Uh, the question is, how will it be organized? How will it be equipped? How will it be financed? And how will it relate to the practical organization of the state and of the market? If its only instruments are the established instruments of private law, the law of property and of contract, and it, if, if it is financed primarily by the uh, charitable deduction in the tax system, then it comes to mean very little and threatens to become just an instrument for the hobby horses of the rich. Its practical form is vastly inadequate to the function that it is supposed to perform in this centrist ideology. Then there's progressive taxation. Now, I've argued that progressive taxation has only a marginal effect on the distribution of economic advantage. If we understand by economic advantage, on the one hand, stakes and assets, and on the other hand, capabilities and opportunities. What matters are the arrangements that define the original distribution of economic advantage. They matter much more than everything that we can do after the fact to correct the original redistribution. And even with respect to this corrective redistribution, what matters most in the short term is the aggregate level of the tax take and how it is spent much more than the progressive profile of the tax system on the revenue raising side. The respect given to progressive taxation seems to perform largely the function of being a placeholder for a missing structural program and is used by politicians simply to signify on whose side they're on. Third, there are entitlements. Now, entitlements are useful and even indispensable as devices to ensure economic security, safeguards against economic insecurity, so long as they are a counterpart to institutional innovations that democratize the economy and deepen democracy that elevate the temperature and hasten the pace of politics, that reshape the economic order. What they cannot be is a substitute for such a structural program. And the fourth diversion is identity politics. Identity politics as a way of evading the institutional reorganization of the economy and of politics, rather than identity politics as just one more channel among many leading back to the structural task. Now then, the fourth step, the project. What in general is the conception of the project, of the work to be done, that emerges from this argument. It is to shift the focus of attention of the progressives from stabilization of the economy and economic security to empowerment and innovation, to a form of innovation of mastery of the context in which many can share. 
That's the idea of a shared greatness, a shared bigness. Uh, and there are then, uh, in that spirit, three large projects that complement one another. First, there is the project of democratizing the economy. And that project, in the circumstances of today, I have argued in my interventions here, has three main elements. The first element is the attempt to establish the advanced practice of production, the knowledge economy, in inclusive rather than in insular form. The second element is to change the relation of labor to capital so that economic flexibility not serve as a pretext for the relegation of an increasing part of the labor force to radical economic insecurity, precarious employment. And the third element is the reshaping of the relation of finance to the real economy or production, so that finance be enlisted in the service of the productive agenda of society and be turned into a useful servant rather than allowed to remain a bad master. The second axis in this program is the educational access, the transformation of consciousness, and the establishment of a form of education that empowers the mass of ordinary citizens. A different kind of education. Uh, and a kind of education developed in an institutional and financial context that reconciles the local management of the schools with national standards of investment and quality. The third element is the deepening of democracy, the creation of a high energy democracy that raises the temperature of politics, hastens the pace of politics, and combines the possibility of decisive central initiative with divergence, with the creation of counter models of the national future in particular parts of the federal system. Now comes what I think is, at this juncture in our discussion, mm. the most important part of mm. uh, our work, which is what I want to call the threshold. By the threshold, I mean how to conceive the translation of an alternative like this one into the immediate circumstance, the, the, the selection of the first steps. What defines a programmatic argument is not some kind of conceptual blueprint. It's the combination of the, the, the view of a direction, a trajectory, with the selection of the initial steps by which to begin to move in that direction. So this is what we must always do in transformative practice and transformative vision. We must have an idea of an alternative future, but we must be able to offer down payments, things that can be done in the short term that offer tangible embodiments of that alternative direction. And now, just very schematically, uh, a brief list without explanation or development of what some elements of this threshold in the present American circumstance might be. So first, with respect to the economy and the democratization of the market order. One set of initiatives would be initiatives in which the government, not acting through centralized decision, 
but acting through an intermediate level of independent centers, uh, financed and equipped to experiment in different directions, would try to bring a larger part of retrograde small and medium-sized firms up into the vanguard of production, broadening access to the crucial resources, not just of credit or capital, but also of technology, advanced practice, and advanced knowledge. So as step by step to create the conditions for an, an inclusive vanguardism. A second set of initiatives would be designed to create a legal regime to protect workers who are thrown by the changes of the new economy into situations of precarious employment. For example, involuntary self-employment. Uh, we need a new legal regime to protect, organize, and represent those workers who are slowly becoming a majority of the labor force. Mm. There is no chance, there is no prospect of an inclusive vanguardism in the United States if the majority of the labor force is delivered to a situation of radical economic insecurity in precarious employment. And a series of legal principles, such as the principle that I mentioned in an earlier class, of price neutrality. Precarious labor has to be remunerated at a level at least comparable to the analogous labor performed under conditions of stable employment. Now let me give you a third example uh, that will require a little more elucidation. Uh, take some of the mega enterprises of the digital part of the new economy, and especially the the platform businesses that we discussed earlier in, in today's class. So they have an increasing amount of power, and they present the following dilemma. Uh, if we revise and develop the antitrust laws to break them up, we could destroy a large part of their value. The value of the platform depends on its universality. That is, it is useful precisely because so many people participate into it. If the way of making it accountable is to break it up, then we may make it accountable only by destroying the value. So in certain circumstances, we would have to have another procedure for mastering these mega enterprises. And that would be to subject them to the power of independent civil society. Not necessarily just regulatory power by the government, but the representation of social interests, of collective interests, in independent trusts, for example, as a legal vehicle, uh, that would have power over their decisions, over their governance. In other words, this new economy requires a new form of governance that straddles the divide between public and private. And that then presents an extraordinary frontier for institutional architecture, for the development of institutional innovations that should appeal to the progressives. Uh, now let me turn to the, to the part of the threshold that has to do with education. Uh, the fundamental problem in the United States is that there is a radical educational dualism, a division between two levels of the school system. There's an elite level, the elite private schools, and the top tier of public schools, the specialized public schools in the, in the big cities or the public schools in the rich suburbs. And then there's the rest. 
and there's a radical difference in the quality of education in these two parts of the school system. Uh, this educational dualism has to be attacked head on. Uh, it has to be attacked by detaching the basis of school finance from local or municipal finance. The school system cannot depend on local finance, and that requires a redesign of American federalism. At the same time, and this is then the second element of the educational part of the threshold, there has to be uh, a national curriculum in the United States. Uh, the so-called core is not a national curriculum. It's just a set of testing or standard procedures. And it has to be a curriculum addressed to a very particular model of education, a form of education that is analytical in its concerns, that is, it privileges analytic and synthetic capabilities over the mastery of content, that with respect to content, prefers selective deepening to encyclopedic superficiality, that insists on cooperation rather than on the juxtaposition of individualism and authoritarianism in the classroom, and that above all is dialectical in its approach to the received body of knowledge, dealing with every subject from the earliest stages of education from contrasting points of view. Uh, and it would be then an education to create a society of experimentalists and innovators that a contemporary, which a contemporary democracy must be uh, if, it is to, if it is to flourish. Uh, now we then turn to the part of the threshold that has to do with politics, the organization of democratic politics. There are three large elements in the creation of a high energy democracy. There are the elements that have to do with the level of political mobilization, of popular engagement in political life, what I call the temperature of politics. There's the part that has to do with the pace of politics, the rapid resolution of impasse. Uh, and then there's the part that has to do with the relation between uh, central initiative and peripheral experiment in the Federation in parts of the country. Now, my suggestion in an earlier conversation of ours is that contrary to what the American progressives seem to believe, the most promising place in which to start in the United States is not in the first element with respect to the relation between money and politics, which is the object of intense and paralyzing legal and political disputes, but rather in the third element of the re-energizing and reinvention of American federalism, which is widely appealing to many parts of the whole range of political forces in the United States. Uh, but it's a, it's a circumstantial conversation. As long as we know what the direction is, then we can begin to think which initial steps are most promising. Uh, Montaigne said, uh, no wind helps uh, if we don't know to what port we're sailing. So uh, as long as we have a clear sense of the direction, we can make tactical or strategic decisions. If we have no vision of the direction, there is no tactics. It makes no sense. It's a, it's a confusion. And we begin to sink into an anti-pragmatic pragmatism. Now, finally, then I come to the sixth step, the opportunity. There is an immense opportunity to begin to move in such a direction, in alternative directions. And a major part of the opportunity is this. Plutocratic populism has come to power in the United States because the supposed political instrument of the progressives, the Democratic Party, failed to produce a sequel to Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. And the uh, 
American working class, the, the American white working class, rightly believed itself to be abandoned and betrayed by its supposed progressive champions. But uh, plutocratic populism is actually very fragile. So what, what is its content? What are its elements? Uh, its first element is uh, in power concessions to the rich, regulatory and tax concessions to the rich on the supposition that these concessions will produce economic growth that will benefit the majority. The second element is playing for a little more time for declining mass production industry, the so-called Rust Belt in the United States. But it's for this mass production industry. It has no future, but let's give it a few more years. Now, actually, this part of their program is the same as the economic program of the American progressives. They both have the same, idea, the same bad idea because they have no structural alternative. They think that what they can do is buy a little more time for a form of production that has no future. Uh, the third element in the, in the program of plutocratic populism is constraint on immigration, uh, favoring the material interests of low-skilled workers in the United States, and expressing a nationalist idea. And the fourth element is a disposition to strengthen or even to abuse executive authority without any particular constitutional innovations in the arrangement of the American Republic, simply stretching the limits of the existing arrangements. Now, I simply point out to you two, two features of this uh, semi-program that uh, render it very weak. The first feature is that it is actually, with the exception of the third element, the anti-immigration element, unable to help its supposed constituents, the dispossessed working class, the dispossessed white working class. It cannot help them. And the second reason why it is weak is that it has no institutional content. In politics, the only thing that matters in the long term is the institutional legacy. If there's no institutional legacy, nothing has been achieved. You simply reallocated resources temporarily from one group to another, and then the other party will come into power, and they'll reallocate them back. The only thing that matters lastingly in politics is institutional change, and the association of institutional change with ideological change. So this is a huge opportunity, because the plutocratic populism is like a paper tiger. It has, it has no content. It's a scarecrow. It's, it's, uh, and if the progressives had an alternative, they would have an immense opportunity. Now, I want to mention one other aspect of the historical circumstance that composes the opportunity. The dismantlement of liberal imperialism. This is the first time, the first time since the closing years of the Second World War 75 years ago, that the United States and its governing elites have no plan for the world. And this is a remarkable change in the historical circumstance. The, the entanglements of the United States in the imposition of its project for the world have had a host of practical and imaginative consequences inhibiting transformation within the United States. Now the United States has no plan for the world. Uh, and that means that there is a fundamental change in this respect, that a whole level of determinations, of constraints on internal transformation has suddenly disappeared. 
It's not to say that the United States doesn't remain entangled with a range of client states that remain under its, under its influence. But to have client states is very different from having a plan for the world. Uh, now, uh, concluding by relating what I've just said to Cornell's remarks in the first half of the class, there's something missing from this discourse of mine just now. And what's missing is precisely what he emphasized, the prophetic element. So I have just now chosen to speak about practical matters of political economy and institutional change. But the enigmatic alchemy that makes everything different is the marriage of institutional change to vision. This is the prophetic element in politics, which is, which is miraculous in its occurrence and in its powers. And what we would most want if we have our hearts set on transformation and on the, the ascent of the ordinary man and woman to a higher form of life is the marriage of institutional change to prophetic vision. We have, we have some time to discuss yeah, absolutely. now. Let me just make this one point, though, about the um President plutocratic populism being a paper tiger. That, and you tell me what you think about this claim, the neo-fascist stirrings that are taking place, producing such thick waves of polarization and balkanization, deeply racist, deeply sexist, more and more anti-Arab, anti-Muslim, anti-Jewish, yes. that the cultural legacy of the neo fascist stirrings can cut so deep that the very notion of entering public space, of conceiving oneself as a citizen, is radically called yes. into question. Now, if of that's course. the case, then that's not a paper tiger. No, that's but that's, else. no, that, but that the consequence, so yeah. let, let me correct sure. or qualify sure. what I said. Sure. So the project itself, their project, the, this, this project that I described as plutocratic populism mm -hmm. is precarious for the two reasons I mm -hmm. cited. Mm -hmm. But it has real consequences because if it does not come to the assistance of uh, the white working class in whose name it came to power, then there will be this experience of belittlement, of humiliation, and of constraint. And we know from historical experience that that is then the climate Absolutely. in which these animosities, these hatreds, uh, uh, these forms of radical resentment proliferate. And, but what is the antidote to them? The antidote to them is to make the weak strong. Uh, and, that's, and that's what we believe. We believe that, that the vast majority of political evil arises not from malevolence but from weakness. And the, or that rather weakness breeds malevolence, and and that and that, that this and that we must therefore carry the contest onto the terrain of the conditions that establish a shared strength. That that's the mm. point. Mm. So you're quite correct mm. that we can't deny that the the the, the dangerous consequences. So the the project. The, the project of the plutocratic populism is weak, but its consequences are formidable. Absolutely. And, and in that respect, I agree with you entirely. Mm-hmm. Questions, please. Oh, you have it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, good to see you. Good to see you. The national curriculum. The national curriculum. I'm yes. thinking specifically thinking about the time of war, which kind of is on its way all the way out. And that was just going to be standards or expectations. Now the narrative around that changed, but they were just expectations um, suggestive of what can be changed here in a way um, that people did not agree with the fact that we should have a standard expectation of what can perhaps it would be framed differently, but 
Well, if, yeah, yeah, but, but I think there's a confusion because we shouldn't think that a national curriculum is just like a radicalized version of the Common Core. The Common Core is about standards and tests and so forth. I'm thinking of something different, the pedagogic paradigm. This is the, this is the kind of thing that concerned the, the greatest educational reformer in the United States, John Dewey. So it's what, what education should be like. What is, what is the way of teaching and learning? That's what matters. It, discussion of test taking and standards and so forth, this is all secondary. So the question is the, 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 the view of the character of education. And those attributes that I mentioned are about that. Now, allow me to say a word about John Dewey's program, because I think this is important in our, mm. in our discussion. Mm. Uh, I, there's the educational dualism, but it's not as if the top tier were entirely admirable. So the top tier now in the United States is a perverted version of John Dewey's program. So John Dewey's educational program had two parts. One part was the emphasis on, uh, on analysis and problem solving rather than on the encyclopedia. That's the part that the, that the Americans in this elite section of their school system assimilated. But John Dewey's program had a second part, which was critical distancing from the existing culture, the existing society, equipment for transformative resistance uh, in, in, in opposition to the idea of team playing, of being easy to get along with. Now, that's the part of Dewey's program that was rejected. And it was replaced by something. What it was replaced by was the cultivation of a particular style of sociability, which is regarded as useful or even indispensable for incorporation into the American professional and business class. So what is this st style of sociability? It's talking everything through with your fellows in a way in which you cast on them the halo of a seductive but concealed and self-denying charisma. Uh, and you situate yourself in relation to them in a middle distance of cheerful, impersonal friendliness. So this, this, is, the very, this is the very particular style of sociability that these schools in the top tier are devoted to cultivating. Uh, and, well, you, and you think that's hegemonic at home? Uh, let, let's separate the discussion well, of the let's university let's because they. Let's look at yes, the yes, yes. So, so this, so this is the reality of the top tier of the dualistic system. The top tier. It's it's not as if what I'm proposing is to extend the reality of the top tier now to the bottom tier. I'm proposing a different yeah, direction, yeah. Okay. which is against both tiers of the present system. I think we got a question yes. right in the back here. It's connected to this. Correct. Everything taught at least twice. No, I, I think, well, this is, of course, the ancient paradox of, of all forms of democracy and liberalism. The, 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 the paradox is about, quote, forcing people to be free, right? Uh, but I don't think that's the idea. I think that this general direction that I'm describing is compatible with a wide range. Uh, so if I could just mm, say something mm. about the universities now, going back to a discussion that we had earlier in the course, mm -hmm. because Cornell raised the question of Harvard. So the, the, the orthodoxies of the university system are based on the forced marriage of methods to subject matters. So 
Uh, so, for example, uh, evolutionary biology has a historical method. Fundamental physics has an anti-historical method. Well, why? The universe has a history we now know. Uh, economics uh, is not the study of the economy. Economics is the study of a method. And most of what is done now in the name of economics has nothing to do with the economy. Now, what happens with the national curriculums in the world? The national curriculums in the world are infantilizations of these orthodoxies of the university culture. What they do is they project back to the education of the young those orthodoxies and induce the young to mistake the dominant ideas in the university culture for the way things are. So then the young are delivered to the higher stages of education totally, totally emasculated and, and hapless, helpless, and prepared for a life of intellectual servility. So the idea of the dialectical method is that the early stages of education should be more profound than the present university education and should immunize mm. them mm. against this. Now, it's related mm. to this problem of the style of sociability because mm. a dialectical form of education um, is not going to be uh, compatible with uh, enthroning a cheerful, impersonal friendliness or uh, a style of sociability of people who like to get along with their fellows. It is going to be favorable to disruption and disruptors and to troublemakers. Uh, and that's a different, that's a higher ideal. And, and that's an ideal that's more faithful to the conception of democratic empowerment, to this idea of the greatness of the ordinary. So this is a contest. This is a contest which, on the one hand, has roots in the practical requirements of the knowledge economy, but on the other hand, has roots in this vision of what has greatest value in democratic life. Uh, we've run out of time, mm. but this is a good, yeah, uh, a good to, point of departure to continue. To continue. Next week. Yes. We've got to come back yes. to this next week. Yes. Absolutely. Have a wonderful week.